So our, our topic today is using leverage events to fill your greatness tracker and grow your business. Um, I put this in here because leverage events are like my favorite way to fill my greatness tracker. Um, I really, I really don't love making phone calls to be perfectly honest. Um, so leverage events are kind of how I, I get all the stuff that I need to get for my greatness tracker. Uh, we do at least two a month, um, sometimes more. Uh, so quite a, quite a few, I think, by most people's standards. But um, before I dive into that, I would like to just do a quick, uh, just some quick housekeeping stuff and then also ask a quick question. So first off, my assistant, Megan, is on here. I, I know there will be Q&A at the end, but I would prefer if you guys just raise your hand if we're talking about something and you've got a question or some feedback or whatever. Um, so just raise your hand and she'll find you on the the screen and then let me know and uh, we'll we'll get your questions answered as we go along um, and then also we'll have a few sections where uh, we're looking for some input for you guys and you guys can put that in the chat and we'll moderate it that way so uh, first question is who does leveraged events regularly and by regularly I would say at least one a month oh, not a lot all right, I'm gonna go to a different large gallery view. I see Jonas raised his hand. I can't see everybody. So Chris, Ed. So, okay, so not a huge percentage. Okay, so good. Um, Grace has got her hand up, but we're, I mean, we're maybe like less than 25% of you guys are doing these regularly. Um, so I think this will be really good for everyone else. Um, I'm gonna go into why I like them, but, but we're also gonna go in during this on the, kind of how we operate them. Uh, and try and come up with a way that this can be streamlined for for you so that you can do this without it being a whole bunch of work. So uh, let's dive in right here to to why I really like leveraged events. So first thing with leveraged events is it's really efficient. Um, you know, our I would say our average leveraged event, um, you know, usually has about 10 agents at it. Um, we've had leveraged events with up to about 30, 35 agents. But I'd say the average one has about 10 agents and it lasts, depending on the type of event, somewhere between an hour and two hours. So um, being able to get face to faces, break breads, et cetera, with that many agents in that short a period of time is a really efficient way to do business. Uh, the second thing is if you're doing them right, they're a lot of fun. Um, you know, more fun than sitting in the office making calls is going to, uh, you know, a restaurant and having a meal or a bar and having a drink or, you know, some sort of other activity. Uh, we had a we had a happy hour last night at a, a brewery here in town. They had cornhole boards. It was outside. The weather was beautiful. Um, everybody hung out, ate pizza, drank beer and cider, and just had a great time. But we got some business done, met some new agents, scheduled some stuff. Um, you know, so got a lot of work done, but it was a really fun way to do it. Uh, second thing is if you've got any sort of team, like an assistant, you can actually delegate a lot of the work. Um, now, if you're on your own, and you don't have an assistant, obviously you're not going to delegate it. And so we're going to go into kind of what we do and how to do it efficiently so that if you're flying solo, you can still put these on without taking up too much of your time. But, you know, just as an example on, on our team, uh, Megan, who's actually here on the call, she coordinates these and um, like I literally just show up. So the the amount of, of effort into it, um, you know, like as far as setup or setting the, uh, you know, reservations, all that stuff, it's all taken care of. So if you're a loan officer with an assistant, you can not only get a lot done in, you know, during that event, but you can do it with virtually no legwork on your part. Uh, and then the last part is these things highlight you as either popular or knowledgeable. I always think of like, if you like go to like a kid's birthday party, and I see this with my kids, everybody wants to sit next to who when the cake comes out. They all sit down. They all want to sit next to the birthday boy, right? Like or birthday girl, right? Now, that's not my kid's best friend, right? His best friend might be at the party, but he still some for some reason wants to sit next to the birthday boy, right? It's like they're the center of attention. It's their, it's their deal, their event. And so everybody wants to be around them. Um, leverage events are kind of the same thing. You know, if you're doing a happy hour and it's your happy hour and you hosted it, everybody wants to sit by you. Everybody wants to talk to you. You become kind of the center of attention um, and it highlights you in a way because at a lot of these, oops, you've got people who maybe 
maybe don't know you as well. Like ours are a mix. Like there are people who love us and use us all the time. And maybe some people who we've just recently met and are unsure about us. But those people get to see us in a light where we're really popular, really desirable to other agents. And then if you're doing something like a lunch and learn, if you're the speaker, you get to come off as really knowledgeable. And it's a way to show your expertise um, before you've actually had live loan experience with those agents. All right, so let's look at our process for leveraged events. So um, we've got kind of a few steps in here. It looks like a lot, but it's really not. I also wanted to include for you guys some of the tools we use for our, our process. Um, so the biggest thing I think that people miss with leveraged events is they don't put together an annual schedule for their leveraged events. And the challenge with not putting together an annual schedule for your leveraged events is you'll never actually find the time to do them. You'll think that it's a good idea. You'll say, hey, I'm going to do an event in July. It's going to be great. And then all of a sudden, your July 10th event, you'll be looking up and it's June 29th. And you're like, shoot, I don't have enough time to get it put together and to get my invites out and to call my agents and do all the stuff. And so you just you skip it and you're like, well, I'll put it off till next month. And then next month, the same thing happens. You look up and you're 10 days before the event time and you don't have it. So you want to schedule it out for the entire year. It's kind of a fun exercise to do is to sit down. You can do it right now. I mean, it doesn't have to be the beginning of the year when you do it. Sit down and go through the different types of events you want to do, where you want to place them in the year and, and get them all on the calendar. Um, the other piece with that is you want to focus on where you want to do them. Uh, we cover a pretty big county, so we kind of move our events around a little bit um, so that we can hit different locations and different agents. We found that with our leveraged events, agents won't drive a really, really long ways to come to the event. They'll drive, you know, maybe 15, 20 minutes, but if you start getting farther than that, people just don't come because it's inconvenient. So if you're hosting an event and you want to hit different kind of areas, sometimes you need to move that event into a location where those people can come. And then you also need to think about the venue and how it fits with what you're doing. So we have certain venues we really like for happy hours, for example, um, and other things that we like for, you know, things like lunch and learns and, and those type of things. Uh, and then also come up with start times. One thing I would say on the scheduling is you do want to try and be consistent. It'll help you um, for one. Uh, and then also we find that you actually do tend to get agents that kind of return more often if you're consistent. So if you've got that, hey, we do this on the first Thursday of every month type of setup with your scheduling, that tends to work really well. So let's go into kind of that pre-event schedule and what we're looking to do. And, and I included in here, like I said, some of the software that we use for these. So um, we start about three weeks out. I know some people will start farther than that. I find with real estate agents, honestly, I'm not even sure that you need three weeks because they basically live their whole life like within a 24 hour period. So, but we start three weeks out and we send our official invite. Um, we do that through Eventbrite. Uh, Eventbrite is free. Uh, it also sends reminders. So that's one of the reasons that we like it. So once somebody agrees to come, they get reminders about when the, when the uh, event's coming up. At about the same time that we're putting that invite together, we're also creating flyers. You can build these in Surefire, which is also free. Uh, well, through Summit, it's free anyways. Uh, we use Canva as well. Um, you can get a Canva Pro subscription for $12.99 a month. We like Canva for all sorts of stuff, flyers for events, but also you know different types of flyers and social media posts and, and various things. So we use Canva a lot. It's great if you've never used it. Take a look at it. Uh, about two weeks before, we'll film a video and we'll send a video out. Um, that video is usually takes me about two minutes, uh, if that, to film. Um, we use BombBomb for that, and then we send that out to our realtor mailing list. Uh, one thing I would encourage you with your video invites is encourage your agents to bring a friend uh, for a couple of reasons. One, it introduces you to new people, which is great. Uh, but two, sometimes we'll have agents that maybe you know a little bit, but they don't want to come by themselves because they're afraid they're not really going to know anybody. And they might think it's awkward to sit there with you for an hour and a half and just talk to you if not a lot of other people show up. So if they bring a friend, they're more likely to come. Also avoid some of that social awkwardness and you get to meet new people. Uh, we typically do our calls about a week before, at least our initial call on it. Um, the great thing about this is it's a an easy call to make. Uh, if you're doing your Monday calls, your 40 Realtor calls, this is an easy one. It's a low pressure thing. You're inviting them to something. 
Um, and again, the calls are important too because it's not just about who shows up, it's about who you invited. Um, we've had tons of agents who will like ap actually apologize for not making our events um, because they are like, hey, it's so great of you to invite us to these events. We really want to make it. I've just been so busy lately, but you know, I really appreciate it. Thank you. But they'll make an effort to reach out and apologize just because they can't make it to those events, which tells you that they do, you know, they are getting those messages. They are listening to them. You are on the top of their mind. And uh, sometimes that kind of plays into, you know, maybe getting a referral out of them because they feel bad for, you know, not attending all the stuff that you invite them to. Um, obviously, calls are free. You know, you've got cell phones. We've got, uh, you know, the, the VOIP that we have through the company, um, but also uh, with phone calls, um, kind of a little cheat code is to use slide broadcast. So if you get busy and you can't make all your phone calls to agents, or if you want to invite a lot of agents to something, um, you can use slide broadcast to drop a voicemail to 100 agents all at once. Um, slide broadcast is about 25 to to $100 a month, depending on how much you want to use it. If you were just using it for your leveraged events, probably could do it for about $25 a month. So it's relatively cheap. For those of you who aren't familiar with it, basically it's a service that the phone doesn't ring when the when uh, the calls go out and it goes straight to people's voicemail. So they get a voicemail from you uh, where you get to you know tell them all about the event. You make it sound like you actually called them. You just don't throw their name in there. So it can apply to everybody. Um, and it works pretty well for getting that out to a mass audience without taking a lot of time. Um, which is really important because sometimes you won't have the time or you'll run behind and you don't want it to, to screw up your event just because you didn't have the time to call everybody. Uh, text, uh, we'll text a couple days before. Um, Eventbrite does email reminders, but we like to do text reminders as well. So our texts are two types of texts. We'll text as a reminder to the people who've already signed up. Um, we'll also text to folks that just haven't signed up. Um, if you're if you're using Django, there might be some mass texting. I don't do it through Django, to be honest. I'll just shoot out a text to a whole bunch of different agents. I'll copy and paste it, you know, the same text over and over to a bunch of different folks. What I will say, probably the best example of this, uh, Rudy in our office, like he won't have anybody signed up in the day before. He'll send out a text to a whole bunch of agents and he'll get like nine agents there for an event. So this it's really really easy and people will sign up and don't be afraid if you haven't you know called a whole bunch of people to send them a text you know a couple days before the event to get some signups uh, and the last one is reminder calls either the day before or the morning of again free using your phone all right so let's talk about i'm going to focus on two different types of events we actually host a number of different events we host uh, events for past clients as well, but I'm going to focus on the ones that fill up your greatness tracker. And so I think those two events are happy hours and lunch and lunch. Um, so our event schedule for happy hours, um, and like I said, on my team, Megan does this, but I think you can do this for yourself. And as you kind of go through, you'll see it's not a tremendous amount of time. Uh, the day before, we'll just call the venue to kind of confirm when we're going to be there, how many people we expect to have, etc. cetera. Uh, morning of, we'll review our RSVPs, uh, just make sure we've kind of got an accurate head count going in. Uh, arrive 15 to 30 minutes. And this is important for two reasons. One, you want to make sure that they've set everything up the way they're supposed to, that they've got a table that's big enough for you or they've cordoned off the area where you're expected to be. But you also want to get some food orders in before people arrive. Um, sometimes if you wait to order until people are there and the food takes 20 or 30 minutes, you kind of go a long time where people don't have anything to, to snack on. So you want to get those food orders in. Um, you definitely want to track who's there. So you can do this with a formal sign-in sheet. Formal sign-in sheets are a little bit easier at like a lunch and learn where everybody's kind of sitting in an office setting and pretty easy to fill out. Sometimes it's a little tricky at leveraged events because people are coming in maybe from different entry points at different times, et cetera. You're in the middle of talking to someone. It's hard to get them to go sign up for a sheet. So one of the things that we'll do is we'll take pictures during the event and it kind of doubles as two pieces. One, we use them for social media, which is really important to pump up your events. Um, but also uh, it's a way for us to kind of get a picture of everybody who showed up and that's what we'll use to kind of track who was there if we didn't get a formal sign in sheet. Uh, about 30 minutes before you're done, check in with your server or your manager, let them know your drink cutoff time um, and how you're going to handle payment, you know, um, and just kind of make sure that's set up. Um, these things can drag on if you don't set some parameters around it. So we found the easiest way to keep them from dragging on is to cut off the the bar at some point, and that tends to be when people 
you know, start to trickle out. So um, we typically do ours, our happy hours are about two hours usually. So from five to seven is our typical happy hour. And we'll let the bartender know that, hey, you know, as of about seven o'clock, go ahead and cut that off or 645, cut off the, the bar tab. Um, and then the next thing the day after, you're going to want to review that attendee list and you're going to want to send out thank you cards. So it creates a great opportunity. I always hear like, well, 20 thank you cards. Who am I going to send 20 thank you cards to? Well, if you have a leveraged event, you probably got five or 10 people right there to send thank you cards to. Um, real quick, and we'll go through this pretty quickly. This is leverage events for lunch and learn. So it's not dramatically different. Um, our lunch and learns we typically host in our office. Um, we've set up a little kind of classroom area in our office. Um, where we host our lunch and learn. So the day before, we're going to get a final head count and actually order the food, because if you're bringing the food into the office, you've got to give them a little bit more leeway with catering orders. So it's not as simple as just ordering the day of. Uh, morning of, we'll set up the space. So if we know we've got a lot of people, um, we've got kind of a classroom area, but we'll sometimes move the tables out and just fill it with chairs if we've got a whole bunch of people. If we've got enough room, we'll leave the tables out so people have kind of desks and so forth to write on. So we kind of move that around. We also like to set out signs if you've got some sandwich board signs or um, you know, if you want to put something in your lobby or something, just because if you don't have a front desk person there that's greeting everybody, you want to you know, kind of point people in the right directions. About 15 minutes before we set up the food and we're ready to greet our guests, um, at the presentation, we're definitely doing a sign-up sheet if it's a lunch and learn, uh, just because it's easy and you can pass it around. Uh, we also like to keep pens, notepads, so forth. So if someone comes in a little bit unprepared, uh, we can hand them something, they can take notes and so forth. Um, and then during, um, someone should be assigned to moderate for questions. So uh, usually that's the loan officer if you're hosting it. Um, just making sure if you're listening to a speaker that you're these are, and we've been doing these a lot with the summit lunch and learn. So summit's providing the speaker, we're putting them up on the TV, um, but someone's moderating if, if people in the crowd have questions. Uh, and then also kind of doing a little bit of cleanup. Uh, after, thank everyone, make sure you've got your sign up sheet and day after again, sending thank you cards to the attendees. Does anybody have any questions on kind of just getting one of these setups or concerns like, hey, that sounds like a lot of work or how do you get around this thing? Because this is why I don't do them. Anything like that? Yeah, I just like that you're doing, uh, having somebody else do the work with the speaking, right? So the summit ones are great and you don't have to host the lunch and learns every time, or you don't have to be the speaker, I should say. So how have you found that to be? You're getting a lot of people to show up to those. I haven't hosted a lunch and learn for the national lunch and learn in person yet, but I'm planning on doing it this time around. So how's it been? It's actually been really good. Um, we get so so we do it within our office, right? So it's more than just me. So all the loan officers will invite folks to it. Um, our Stockton office isn't huge, though, because we're kind of in split locations. So our branch is, is split amongst a few offices. So we'll have like three, four loan officers that invite people. I'd say our average attendance is about 15 to 20 agents. Um, and it works really, really well because it's pretty simple. You know, you're you're not having to present. You don't have to spend a bunch of time putting together a PowerPoint or anything like that. Um, and, you know, I'll do a little bit of intro and I'll moderate and then I'll thank everybody at the end and, you know, try and do a plug for the loan officers and for referrals. But it's really a, a pretty streamlined process. And we don't actually share that it can be viewed uh, remotely. So when we send out the invites, we actually remove all the information about people being able to, you know, just watch it from their own desktop at their house or at their office or whatever, because we actually want people to come in to our office. And then if we get some cancellations, we're like, oh, I can't make it. Can you send me a recording? Uh, we'll either send them the recording or sometimes at the last second, we'll we'll pop out like, hey, if you're going to miss, here's the here's how you can log in. But we really want to get people to come to the office because it's a way for us to see people in person and build a little bit more rapport. They know it's going to be on TV, though, or like on, you know. Yeah, yeah, they do. Um, and we kind of push it from the standpoint of like, you're getting better content because you were doing this on TV, right? Like, if we we're to bring in a live speaker, you know, I, I might be able to get Robin Lavaster to do a presentation for me once a year in person if I was lucky, but even that would be a big ask. But if she's, you know, doing it remotely for the whole company, you know, she could do it multiple times a year or some of the, you know, real estate folks that we've had from different coaching things. I'd never be able to get them to come into our office if they're out of state and do this presentation, but they can do it, 
you know, do it here. And because we have access to them, we can ask questions. Yeah, it's on TV, but it's not like it's recorded. You know, it's live. You can interact. You can ask questions and so forth. Yep, right on. Cool. Any other uh, questions, concerns, thoughts? All right, sweet. Let's go on to the next next slide then. Um, so, uh, why do we like these for filling up our greatness tracker? I think leverage events are the very best way to fill up your greatness tracker because it hits every single subset of your greatness tracker, every single category on there. So we start with calls, right? We're going to call, have a reason to call all of the agents on our list. So you can get, I mean, you can call 100 agents, 200 agents. The beauty of inviting them to an event is it's an easy call even to agents you don't know, right? It's as simple as saying, hey, I'm calling all the agents in your office to invite you to our Lunch and Learn. It's open to everybody. Even if you don't work with us, it's going to be great information. Please come on by, right? So it's low pressure calls. You can make a ton of them. You can fill up your greatness tracker with calls. We talked about during that process how we film a video to tell them a little bit about our Lunch and Learn and invite them to the Lunch and Learn. So you get to knock out one of the videos. Um, and if you've got most, most of you should have a pretty big agent database and it's not very hard to create a large agent database. You don't actually need their permission to put them in your database and send stuff to them. So you can be sending videos to at least a couple hundred agents um, with some regularity. If you're doing two events a month and you're doing a video for each event, that's two videos to 200 agents every single month. Uh, next one, face-to-face. You know, -face. So a couple ways to get face-to-face -face at your event. You're typically, for us anyways, we're typically getting break breads because most of our events have a food component to them. Um, but we get face-to-face -face because we'll go out, we'll print out flyers, and then I'll swing by on my milk route and drop off flyers at offices. So you can get your face-to-faces in marketing the event and dropping off the flyers, and then you get your break breads at the event with everybody that attends to uh, attends the event. And typically these events are long enough that you get a few minutes to talk to everybody. So I know there's some with coaching. Sometimes it's like, what do you consider a face to face or a break bread? How long do you have to spend with them? My thing is, if you're spending a few minutes having a one on one conversation with that person at the beginning of the event, the end of the event or sometime during the middle of the event, then that is considered a break bread and you get some credit for that. Uh, you obviously get to fill up one of the event spaces, so we should be they want us doing an event a week, so you get to fill up that event. And then thank you card, you get to thank everybody that attended your event with a thank you card. And it's a really easy thank you card to write because you don't have to come up with anything too exciting or creative. You just say, hey, thanks for stopping by. You know, we really appreciate it. All right, so roadblock. So since only about a quarter of the people raise their hand, I want to hear, you can either raise your hand or throw it in the chat. Um, why are people not doing lunch and lunch? What's keeping people from doing it? Chad? Um, not planning it far enough in advance. Like you said, like have, just having it all planned out. <clears throat> and then I, for me, it's probably a mental thing, but the whole idea of lunch and learns, uh, I, I get sick of people that come for the lunch or the booze or whatever, and not for uh, the actual value. And they get expensive when you're paying for a bunch of people for lunch, and especially if it's booze and everything. So. I don't know that those are my apprehensions. Sure. So the one thing I'll say with expense, I, lunch and learns, I think are actually the cheaper of the two. Our lunch and learns, uh, I mean, we basically go order sandwiches from somewhere, you know, um, and, and you can get pretty inexpensive on sandwiches. You can get the, you know, kind of really long deli style sandwiches that are sliced into, you know, three inch sandwiches. So you can go pretty cheap there. Uh, we do our own drinks, so we'll get bottled water, uh, maybe bubbly water if we're feeling really, really fancy for our folks. Uh, and then we'll buy the big, you know, kind of Costco size thing of small individual bags of, of chips. And so those are pretty darn cheap too. So I would say on Lunch and Learns, we get out of them for less than five bucks a head. Uh, I will agree that happy hours can get a little bit more expensive. Um, although I also think with happy hours, you get such great interactions with folks that if you do a good job getting your agents that work with you to bring folks that you don't already know, um, to me, that's a way better setting to talk to people and potentially set up that one on one meeting where you can do a deep dive into their business as opposed to trying to cold call them on the phone and introduce yourself and and then set up that one on one meeting. Uh, it just kind of gives you a, a 
you know, really easy handoff. So it is a little bit more expensive on the happy hour. You know, those probably end up closer to 20 bucks a head, you know, with drinks and food and everything. Um, but again, if you've got 15 agents there, it's 300 bucks once a month. You know, it's not like it's too exorbitant of a cost. What other roadblocks are there? Like Sean has his hand raised. Yep, Sean. Yeah, I mean, I'm doing I'm doing the lunch and learns. My conference room holds about six or seven people, so that seems to be working pretty well. On you know, for the company ones, inviting and lim limited seating. The one that I have difficulty with was when I try to do it myself, uh, say at a title company or some other kind of office like that. Um, just m doing something that gets people to come. I mean. Uh, People say, oh, I'd hate to have a lunch and learn and no one shows up. You know what's worse is one person shows up because then people, then at least one person knows. So I, I mean, I, I really don't like the idea of like one or two people showing up and I'm set up for 18 or something like that. And just, you know, it's it's having a good list of topics to actually get them to come in, um, yep. which, you know, that, that's that's the one thing that I that I have difficulty with. Yeah, one of the suggestions I would make on that, um, and one of the ways that we've done lunch and learns a lot of times in the past, uh, especially when I had that concern, um, it, it just to clarify, so like right now when we're doing them as the branch, there's multiple loan officers, so we tend to have a pretty easy time filling it up. But when I was doing them with just my team and it was a little bit harder to fill them up and you're kind of, and before we had an area to host, you know, the last thing you want to do is go to a hotel and spend $500 to rent their large you know, conference room and then have two people show up because now you're like 250 bucks a head. That's not a very good use of, of your funds. So one of the things that I would do instead is I would go to the real estate offices where I had some relationships and I would host the lunch and learn at their real estate office. So I didn't get maybe all of my agents that I work with in one place, but I would go to that office. I would set up in their office, usually on a day when they had their office meeting and I know those are a little more sparsely attended post COVID, um, but still we're starting to see more people come in person to those, at least in our market. And so I'd set up my lunch and learn at their office at usually the larger offices. And I wouldn't worry about who came, like if they were agents that worked with me or didn't work with me, I would view it as a way for myself to, to meet new agents or maybe some agents that kind of know me, but build a little bit more relationship with, especially if I'm presenting, because it kind of puts me in the light of being an expert on some topic. And I find that you get a lot more attendance if you go to them than if you expect them to drive to you, because at the very least, even if you only have a few signups, you'll get a few other people who just happen to be in the office that'll, you know, come sit in because it's convenient and it's free food. That's good. Thanks. Hey, Blake, Chris made a good comment in the chat that he had a big turnout for an appraiser at Lunch and Learn. So that's another idea is to co-host one, bring in someone with another field of expertise and come together with them on that. Yeah. And actually on that uh, on that line, I'd love it if. If everybody wants to anything they've hosted uh, that's had a great turnout, that's a third party. Um, if you want to throw it into the chat, I think that would be great because that is the other thing is coming up with ideas. And I know not everybody likes to present, so that can be a big obstacle to folks who are hosting their own lunch and learns. So, um, Chris, thank you for that suggestion on the appraisal lunch and learn. Um, but if, if you guys just want to type in anything that you've seen have a lot of success in your branch or uh, that you've done personally, that would be great. I'll give you guys about 30 seconds to do that. Awesome. So we've got uh, we've got a few different ones on here that um, so high producing realtor panel. Um, this goes over really well. Um, we've uh, done different versions of this um, and actually some of the summit lunch and learns have had agents on them, super high producing agents. So I think that's a great uh, a great one, um, especially if you have maybe a relationship or two with some of the top agents in your in your market. Um, it can also be a really good way to maybe create those relationships without asking them for business. You're kind of flattering them by telling them they're with one of the top agents in the market and you'd love to, you know, interview them. So that's a great one. Um, realtor coaching co-hosted by a realtor does outside coaching and needed a venue. Uh, yes. And that kind of extends even to other things where people, any industry where they want to market to realtors, but they need a venue um, can be 
can be really good. We did one uh, with a company that specializes in constructing ADUs. Um, and they actually will pay commissions to agents um, if the agents bring them a client for an ADU. Um, and we had, Megan, how many agents did we have? It was huge. It was the biggest one we've ever done by far. Oh, we had 80 something people show up, maybe 80 82. something people yeah. show up. Um, and basically in California, they passed a new ADU law that says you can build ADUs on any property. Basically, no questions asked. They have to approve the permit. Um, ADUs tend to run about $200,000 in California and they pay a 3% commission. So we kind of positioned it to our agents as a way to get paid, you know, from their their client database without actually having to sell those clients a new home because most clients don't want to sell their home right now and buy something else at a higher interest rate. So um, that was a great class. And again, that was a company that was trying to get in front of agents anyways, and we just basically gave them the venue for it. Um, and Jonas put on here, so kind of what I was telling Sean, right, go straight to the straight to the uh, different brokerages. So they're doing their theirs at uh, ERA and HomeSmart going there directly, which again, I love that idea too. I think it's the easiest way to fill up your, your lunch and learns and, and know that people are gonna be there. Uh, rebutting appraisal class. So one other thing to, to think about, so uh, things are a little slower at corporate than they have been in the past. One of the pluses of that is you have more access to some of the people at corporate. Right. So getting someone like Cheryl, who heads up our appraisal department to come speak at your lunch and learn uh, is something that maybe you couldn't have done in 2020 or 2021, but you can do it now because she's got some availability. The same thing goes for someone like Annette or Lori Becker or one of the folks that are higher ups in our underwriting department. If you wanted to, you know, do a panel with an underwriter, you know, where real realtors could ask questions directly to an underwriter, hear directly from an underwriter's mouth on different topics and you can even kind of come up with some questions to ask but um, using and leveraging the folks that are in our corporate office uh, is a really valuable way to you know come up with some stuff that you can do again where you don't have to where you get to speak a little bit which is good it's good if you can talk a little bit but where you don't have to carry the entire presentation all right uh let's see what other what other roadblocks? I don't, I mean, I think the two biggest ones are, are like Chad said, are scheduling cost. And then, and then the last one is kind of coming up with topics and so forth. My recommendation in the short term is two things. One, go straight to the, the real estate offices. Um, I think that's the easiest way to, to get a big group of people. I would leverage our summit lunch and learns. We get good turnouts for those. The content's really great. Um, you know, so I think, and I think you can do lunch and learns are a lot cheaper than happy hours. I really like happy hours. Um, happy hours are also fun. So uh, that would be my one other point in this is schedule stuff that you're actually going to look forward to because you're more likely to do it if you're going to look forward to it. So schedule a happy hour at a place where you want to go and where you want to hang out and where you like the beer or the cocktails or the food or whatever it might be, because you're more likely to look forward to it and get it done. Um, and then the kind of just getting started on this. And so I kind of put what now, and actually the first thing on here is calendar your events, right? So what I would do, if you have an assistant, sit down with your assistant and give them the time and the place and all the different stuff and let your assistant run with it because it will get done uh, If in a way that it won't get done if you just leave it to yourself as a loan officer. Um, if you're a branch manager, if we have any branch managers on here, you can also do this as the entire branch, right? So you can give this to a branch admin who can set up the lunch and learn or the happy hour for the entire branch and kind of leverage one person to set up work for four or five different loan officers. Um, and then if it's overwhelming, then I would do the same event type each month. So rather than trying to put in a lunch and learn and a happy hour right now, pick one or the other and just get that set up for each of the following months. So a lunch and learn, you know, hop on the bandwagon of the corporate lunch and learn and do that every single month going forward if that's what you want to do to make it easy. Or if you like the idea of doing a happy hour, set up the happy hour for whatever the first Wednesday, Thursday of the month. We try not to do them at the end of the month just because you're more likely to have fires and different things that are going to distract you a little bit as a loan officer. Um, so we do them at the beginning of the month when everybody, agents and loan officers both are a little bit more relaxed. Um, but just schedule the one event and get it get it rolling um, and then get comfortable at it. And it makes it a lot easier once you've kind of got in the habit and you're doing the same things over and over. 
um, make it something you'll look forward to, and then get that invite out. Once you, the, the beauty of it is once you send out the invitation, you're obligated <laughs> and you'll get it done. So if you never send out the invitation, you might not, you know, you'll find reasons not to do it. But if you get that first invite out, then then it's going to happen whether you like it or not. Uh, and sometimes it, it might be the best pressure to make your phone calls and do your marketing stuff because, you know, like Sean was saying, it really is one of those things where you don't want to have an event and have nobody show up. It's really kind of embarrassing and anxiety creating. And so if you're checking your RSVP list and you don't have enough people there, it will encourage you to go make some phone calls on a Monday or go do a milk route or, you know, text a bunch of people. But you'll definitely do the activity because you don't want to have you know, nobody at your event. One other thing along those same lines is always invite more people than you think, because even if you've got a lot of RSVPs, you probably, you get between 50 and 75% of your RSVPs is what I find. So if you've got 30 RSVP, you're probably gonna end up with 22 to 25. You're not gonna get everybody. Don't really ever worry about it being too busy. It's, if you think about every party you've ever gone to, right? When they're really packed and it seems too crowded, it actually kind of makes it more fun. I think events are kind of the same way. You want it to you want it to feel like a party. You want it to feel fun. Don't be afraid of over inviting. Uh, and some people aren't going to show up. So you want to make sure you got more people than you need RSVP. All right. And I know I didn't take up the whole hour, so we've got 22 minutes for Q&A, which I don't think we'll need. But um, and some of these pictures in here, these are just from different events that we've done. So, um, you know, you can kind of see this was a Christmas party we did for agents. This was a happy hour. This was a lunch and learn. So we've got some different pictures in here and we'll share this presentation in case it's beneficial uh, for anybody. But I will open it up to Q&A. Um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Put you guys in front of me here. All right. What questions do we have? Hey, Blake, it's Kevin Jefferson. How are you? Good, Kevin. How are you doing? Pretty good, man. Uh, do you do any social media marketing for your um, event? I came on late, so I'm not sure if you. No, it's a great question. And I didn't actually address it in there because I was kind of focusing on filling up the greatness tracker. But yes, we do typically post. And I'll let Megan speak to that because she posts for me. So, Megan, what do we usually post? So typically we create an event on Facebook and share that from his business page. We'll share it onto his personal page. Our team members will share it on their pages and that gets pretty good leverage. And then I'll have Blake do a reel or we'll make some type of post with the flyer we created that we post to Instagram. Thank you. Do you do event bright? Yes. Okay. Yes, that's our primary terms to send out invitations, but as a backup, we like to do um, social media as well in case our invitations for whatever reason end up in someone's junk folder or they don't see it the first time around. And just to reiterate, that's the really nice thing we like about Eventbrite is it sends three reminders from the time they register until the day of the event, just constantly staying in front of them and reminding them for you. So you don't have to do the extra work. But the point of this presentation is to do the extra work to fill up your greatness tracker. So. All right. Thanks, Megan. All right, what are the questions we got? Who's got a who does a lot of uh, events that can maybe add something that I didn't cover in here? You know, like I'll just add on it. It's been great you hosting him from a standpoint of getting together with your other agents in your office, your loan officers. The way you've handled it since you've taken over as district manager has been really wonderful. And last night, two of the agents said to me, Mary, this is so great. We used to feel like we were cheating on you if we went to Blake's happy hour and then we went to your happy hour. So thank you so much for inviting us all here to see each other and introduce each other. And so that's just been really great since you've started doing it. And I didn't have somebody to help me plan it. So with Megan doing it, it makes me really excited just to invite people and then get off to doing loans. Thank you for that, Mary. Um, and I would I would push you guys if you're in a branch and you've got multiple loan officers in the branch, you know, either push your branch manager or get together as a group of loan officers and and you know maybe with a shared assistant have one person coordinated for the group um, can be a nice way to do some of these things because it it alleviates it alleviates a lot of the fears of people not showing up. I mean, worst case scenario, like. I always joke, hey, if nobody shows up, then I'm having, you know, a couple beers with the folks in the office, and that can be kind of fun in and of itself. Um, so, 
you know, leveraging the group to do that can be a really great way um, to do it as well. And it can save you a little bit of time and, and effort also. And if you're in a small market, you know what I mean? Agents will come to talk to, you know, more than one person there. Uh, I think Chris had his hand up and then Ed. Like I, um, Jim helped me shift about a year ago to, to transition just my happy hours. Cause I was, I wasn't getting a ton of people to come there and he was like, Hey, if you got a lot of kids, you're the family friendly lender guy. So bring your kids and do something that's fun for the family. And it's actually helped cut down on the cost too. So I do it at, um, it's called Southside Social. It's a it's a bowling alley that also has a bar that's with it and other fun type stuff. But I pay for the lanes, I pay for people's shoes, and I just pay for the food. And then they pay for their own drinks. And it's on a Tuesday night, so they're half price anyways. Um, so it's been and also just for people that struggle with calls, if you're not making at least twenty, you know, at least twenty to thirty calls, and that makes it really easy for you just to call and invite. Like, hey, I want to pay for your family's dinner. Like that's a pretty easy call to make. Absolutely. And that's a great idea because I do, you know, there are occasionally people are like, hey, I don't really drink, so I really don't want to do a happy hour. Happy hour is really just kind of a, a general term for getting together in the evening with your folks. You know, it doesn't have to be cocktails uh, or it can be at a venue where, you know, the cocktails are optional and that's not what you're paying for. You're giving them something else. So that's a, a great, a great suggestion. Um, pretty much every town has a bowling alley, I feel like. So, you know, that that option's probably out there. And one of the thing when you're checking around with venues, find out when happy hour is, right? Find out when you can get the half price appetizers. You can save a little bit from a cost standpoint. And verify with the venues that they will honor happy hour pricing if you have a group over a certain amount, because we've run into that in the past. Yes. Ed? Do quite a few events with some of the organizations like around horseback riding, trail riding. And what I do is I invite the realtors to sponsor tables like poker runs. I'll put one in the chat. I do. And what I have is five different realtors that are doing poker, um, doing poker tables and it's prizes. And they all tend to just jump in because I want to meet all the people. The other thing I do is I keep them a little bit smaller. I do a shotgun shoot every um every week and I invite four realtors and we go shoot skeet and I invite them over to the house to have steak and a beer afterwards. And I try to keep it small so I can get to know them and go deep. So, yeah. and I think just some better. ideas. Those are great ideas. The, the first one that you do, so the realtors are getting to meet who? All the people that ride in the rides. So I'm part of a multiple, I do a lot of horse properties here. Okay. So a lot of the events that go on, I know about them because I want to be participating in them. So I get sure. realtors to participate and get to know the folks that are, and they just get their name out there. Yeah, no, that's really cool. And and I also like the idea of doing some smaller things. I mean, if you're a golfer, you know, have a foursome every Thursday that, you know, especially if you're like a member at a country club where, you know, you can get on at the same time and it's not going to be a really long round and, you know, coordinate something, find realtors who are golfers and, and coordinate a foursome. If you really like to, you know, if you're really into playing cards, set up a poker game, you know, poker games are great because you can get, you know, however many people you have, you just, if you got a couple of tables, you can five people at works, 20 people at works, right? Yep. Um, but find something that's, that's your vibe and find agents. There's agents who, who like pretty much everything out there. And it might be a great way to, to meet some folks who aren't otherwise working with you. Ed, is your hand up again or still up from before? No, still up, buddy. I okay. apologize. No worries. It just popped up again on my screen. Anyone else have anything to add? Jonas? Jonas might be the best leveraged events guy on here. He's the only person I know who does busloads of realtors to midget wrestling. So I, I want Jonas to comment in some way, shape, or form uh, on, on events. Give us, give us the how to get a ton of agents to a single event because that is actually not something that we focus on that often but i know you're really good at it so guys when i developed this blake was actually my coach so he went through this with me and somewhere in blake's repertoire still has the we support midget violence uh shirt um guys the one thing I'm going to tell you is everybody asks me what phone calls do I get uh, make on Mondays. Raise your hand if your realtors are getting pounded and bored of these phone calls. 
Come on, guys, be honest with each other. Those Monday phone calls are kind of brutal. But right now, I, I've been in a funk just because I have not done any events because of this market. And I finally decided I'm not going to. So I literally this, this morning just bought 50 front row tickets to uh, Guns N' Roses in Seattle. And we are going to do a realtor event again. And on Monday, my phone calls are going to be real simple. Hey, Chad, it's Jonas, buddy. Um, I have you on the past list. I got Guns N' Roses tickets by RESPA. Once again, guys, you have to remember the RESPA rules. Whether you're going to the go-karts or whether you're going to midget wrestling, they have to pay what you're into it. So remember that if you do an event, don't get yourself stuck. But by RESPA, my tickets are blank. Do you want to go? It's absolutely amazing how this spilled on us. Blake watched our silly little trip go from eight people to 82 people over a span of five years. And it's awesome when you're starting small and starting to grow, changing the narrative of the Monday phone calls. Jimmy always talks about going deeper. And Blake pounded it to me. Jonas, you have to have the relationships. Well, when I finally figured out those Monday phone calls are okay and those copies are okay. But when you're sitting next to somebody on a bus or you're going to actually hang out with something they want to do, the relationships start to build. And it was my secret sauce and always will be. And as Blake mentioned, I'm, I'm truly getting out of my funk. I'm going to start getting back to it. So I'm going to start making my monthly trips again and we'll see how it goes. Awesome. Thank you for that, Jonas. And yeah, and, and to reiterate, it's such a different type of relationship building when you're doing a fun activity versus when you're sitting down with your folder in front of them at a little table at a Starbucks and trying to tell them why you're great. At the end of the day, they send you business because they really like you. And then from there, it's your job not to screw it up. So they'll keep sending you business. But if they don't really like you, they're probably not going to send business no matter you know how great your PowerPoint is on your team and everything else. So uh someone's got their hand up but i can't see who it's grace 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 so jonas can you clarify oh he left <laughs> can somebody <laughs> clarify what what is um when he was referring to rest but so are they paying for their tickets is that what he's saying that's what he's saying so i and i will give a little color to that um the they get the most, they have the most, I don't know who, if it's the DR, well, their version of DRE or whatever up there in Washington, but that is like the most scrutinized area for RESPA violations. Um, so I'm going to, maybe this should be off the record. Like we don't make the agents pay for their drinks or their food or anything like that when we do our events. Um, but I know they do a lot of pretty cool events like tickets to shows and Game, you know, baseball games and football games and stuff like that. If you're going to that level and doing things, you do have to have them buy their tickets. Now, what you can do to kind of spruce it up is, hey, you've got to buy the ticket to the concert, but we're going to rent the bus to get everybody up there and we're going to provide some drinks and different things on the bus to make it really, really fun. But you can't at some level when you're giving away tickets, concert tickets, game tickets, et cetera, it can become a RESPA violation if you're not having them you know, participate in some way. Got it. Okay, thank you. Yep. All right. Uh, I don't see any more hands up. So uh, I think on that note, uh, we will end it. Um, thank you guys all for jumping on. Hopefully you guys found this beneficial um, and hopefully uh, everybody will uh, go ahead and get that first lunch and learn or happy hour or some type of leverage event on their calendar. Get that Eventbrite link sent out so you can't can't backtrack from it and you got to honor it. Um, it will it really will make a huge difference in your business. So thank you guys. And if there's anything our team can do to help, also feel free to reach out to Megan or myself. Um, we're happy to you know answer questions or give pointers on any of this stuff. So thank you so much.